my name is Gary. As you remember, part one did not have a happy ending. I was trying to tighten one of the stop dogs and the cast iron fractured. It had a crack in it that's clear from looking at the surface, filled with oil. 114 year old metallurgy. Don't know what the problem was, but it was a stress riser, obviously a crack. The other dog was missing and in its place was a fabricated one out of aluminum. And aluminum just doesn't look right on a hundred year old machine. So I got some ductile iron and I made two new stop dogs. And I did not videotape the production of these, but used my good old friend Godzilla here. It's a 20 inch G&E metal shaper. I could have used a milling machine for most of the work. But frankly, anybody that has a metal shaper and is not trying to make money but is just doing things for fun knows that a metal shaper is too much fun and when you get a chance to use it, you use it. Time to install the new dogs onto the planer. I do table dogs slide in. As I said before, this one probably should go about six inches before the start of the work. So I'll tighten it. And at some point I'd like to put square head bolts in here. I don't have any at the moment of the right size, so I'm using cap screws. This one, roughly even with the end of the work, I believe ought to be about the right place. Let's fire it up and see if we have these in the right place. And the machine on. I have clearance between the work and the tool piece. Check that. So let's just run it back and forth and see if I've got the right travel on it. And I have this set at the slow speed. Probably about 10 inches. Probably move that a little bit closer. Move up through the work. This would be the end of the cut. It's going past about an inch and a half. I like where that one is. You notice the return stroke was faster than the cutting stroke, and that is because the return stroke is from the large belt, cutting stroke from the small one. Here is something I'm not completely happy with. The handle is bouncing back a little bit, and so sometimes the belt is slipping on the return stroke. We're obviously looking at an older technology here. This machine, as I said before, was made around 1900. And in 1900, they didn't have the luxury of having computers to crash every day, two, three times a day, give them a break from work. They didn't have, well, they had electric motors, but they weren't common at that point in time. A lot of the country did not even have electricity. So a lot of machines were run from an overhead line shaft that was driven by a steam engine. This machine was originally designed for line shaft drive, and there was a drive belt, and then a cross belt for reversing the direction of the table. This machine was later retrofitted, and my guess is at roughly around 1915 or so, to run on an electric motor. So, the basic power right now, we have an electric motor dating from roughly 1915. There's a nameplate on it that has Patent dates up through 1913. So I'd say the, the late teens, World War I vintage type of machine. It drives a Llewellyn variable speed drive, okay, made by Llewellyn Manufacturing, Columbus, Ohio. And we'll go around the other side, take a look at that in a moment. Coming out of the Llewellyn drive, 
We have a belt on the far side going up, and then this jack shaft was added on. There's two flat belt pulleys at this end, both fixed pulleys. The small one is for driving the table in the cutting stroke direction. The large one gives a faster return. I have a few questions at the moment that I need to look into. The system's working the way it is, but there's an arrow right here on this shaft showing a counterclockwise rotation from this direction. I can't see the shaft at this point in time. So it's possible that this may actually be running the wrong direction at this point in time. Backing that up, I've seen pictures of planers where the cross belt was on the inner and the drive belt on the outer. So this, using the cross belt to drive and the straight belt for reverse would be consistent with rotating the jack shaft and everything else in the other direction. But the way it's set up right now is the way it came. If I were to reverse the belts around and try that out, I need new belts because they would be a different length and I'm not going to take the time to do that. I'm around on the back of the Llewellyn Drive right now and I have a wheel over here that turns and this indicator indicates speed. I have it set on the slow speed right now. Moving it over in this direction speeds it up. Moving it back slows it down. Kind of a little bit counterintuitive. I'm running it on the slow speed at the moment because I find that if I speed it up too much, the belt shifting mechanism, sometimes the belts tend to jump off. Where it is right now, it takes longer to do work, but if I'm a little bit patient, I can live with that. The expanded metal is obviously not original. This is something that I added, and at the moment it's just temporary until I get time to weld a proper frame for it. But I was just a little bit too nervous wearing the shop apron around these belts and worried about it catching in there. This is something you want to stay away from these moving belts. I really doubt that they're up to modern OSHA standards, uh, but this is actually the way machinery was a century ago. This was considered perfectly acceptable. Nowadays, of course, not, nothing is perfectly acceptable. I want to zoom you in a little bit and show you a little bit about the mechanism and how it works. Now, with the guards in place, it's a little bit difficult to show the reversing mechanism, so I'm going to pull the guards off for a little bit and give you an idea how that works. But when I move the lever and engage it, you can see that we shift, the belt shift over, the table moves, and then when a dog hits the control arm, the shift, belt shifters shift the forward driving belt into play. So right now we're on the cutting stroke, and the table is moving slowly. The dog gets into play, and it bounces, and I get the return stroke. So I can move this back and forth, and it just reciprocates along the way. thing when you get to the end of the stroke cycle and what it does is it moves this rack up and down. That rack, see here, engages the gear connected to this pair of gears out here. Now the larger gear is the driving gear that drives the tool head. The smaller one is just notches for this ratchet that is in here. So I can move this around and so I have a ratchet mechanism each time. At the moment, this is moving about 12 teeth. To engage the tool head cross slide, I can just manually move this gear in and then what will happen, add, I don't know, 8, 10 clicks of the ratchet there. And then, at the start of the cutting stroke, before the tool enters the work, the handle turns and moves the tool head over. Get to the end of the stroke, 
ratchet goes and we'll return back here we go tool head moves over now at the moment this is moving about eight or ten notches I know from experience with this particular cutter that I want to have a very fine feed the finest feed that I measure on here is about twelve and a half thousandths uh, I'm used to ten thousandths on my metal shaper so that's right in the right ballpark so I'm going to want to adjust down below the amount that the rack moves up and down so that I'm getting one click on each return. If I wanted it, I could engage this gear and get an up and down motion out of the tool head. That's not what I want to do right now. I have the tool head locked. Looking at the tool head itself, as things are moving, this is for locking horizontal travel of the tool post. It's loose at the moment. This one's for vertical. Loosen that up. I can engage the vertical feed. And we'll see that it moves at the beginning of the stroke. And in this case, I've got it set for an upward motion. If I reverse the ratchet, I'll get a downward motion. Now I want to set the height of the tool bit to what I want to do on the work. Now, I'm not after a particular thickness right now. All I want to do is to get this side smooth. And one of the things I can tell from the sound, and I could tell earlier by rocking this plate on the table, is the corners underneath are high. It's supporting it. I've got some space in here. So this is not going to be a real precision cut. So all I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm going to lay a ruler across. I'm going to get a shaper gauge in here. And I am going to adjust the height so that I'm just right at the thickness of the work. And then as I move around and check this in various places, I see most of the way on that side, within a thousandth or two either way. Over here, and two three thousandths there, a little bit more, and a little bit more. So this is a little bit of a high spot right here, but so this would be my low side, a little bit high on this side. Now this was originally trimmed up and rough cut oh, maybe five six years ago using my 20 inch metal shaper and the cuts when I did that were going this direction so probably one side of this I can look at and see which way the cuts are going if I was cutting this way so probably I had the upwards end of the table just a, a thousand of an inch, two thousand of an inch higher uh, at least with respect to how I had this set up in the vise or perhaps my parallels in there weren't exactly right maybe something was off but Overall, going from this side to this side, just being two, three thousandths off is not too bad in my mind. So I'm going to set the cut to do a thin cut over here, getting a little bit thicker as I go along. So I set this under the tool bit, and then I'm going to just play and lower this a little bit until I have just starting to clear. Okay, I've just started to catch right there, back up here down right about there okay a little bit of a catching okay I think I have that right again I know from experience four to six thousandths is about all the deeper I want to go so maybe just turn it down one two, three, four, lock the vertical off, now this here. With this tool, clapper set straight or just a little bit over is fine uh, for, because of the design of the tool and because it's such a shallow cut, so I'm happy with that. And the last thing to do is to just get a rough alignment of where I want to start the cut and I 
take the gears out. I'll just move the tool over so that it's just about even with the start of the work. So we'll have a few cycles without any cut. One thing I can do to check things out is I can take the surface gauge and adjust it along here so that as I move around, I'm just touching, give it just a light touch, check that against my shaper tool, same light touch, I'm happy with that. So let's oil it up and get it ready to cut. Large, kind of large area, so I'm just going to pour a little cutting oil on here and spread it around. Don't need a whole lot, but just a little bit of it goes a long way and it helps protect the cutting edge. Certainly, I'm, by the time I get to the end of this, I don't expect it the edge to be in the shape it starts out. This is a piece of what I call junk steel. A36, just mild steel. It's nothing fancy, nothing that has controlled metallurgy. I know from experience it has hard and soft spots in it, but for what I'm using it for, it should be fine. Okay, let's get ready to cut. Start the machine. Check things out. Things are looking good. And now I'm going to release the power back. Well, I made a small adjustment. What I found was the dog was hitting here. So I took a little bit off of the underside of the dog. And so now I have a little bit of clearance. So this handle is actually able to go the full travel, fully reverse the belt. So now I'm getting the proper speed on the reverse. So let's see how we're doing on the cut. I can see we're just starting. This corner is just beginning to cut. I'm not quite perfectly parallel with the stroke, that's fine. And I'm starting to get that nice rolled uh, chip that you get out of a shear cutter. So I'm happy with that. So it looks like we're making progress. Let me see if I can zoom you in closer from the other side. Trying to get full stroke. Looking at the chip, it's the type of chip that I normally expect from a shear cut. So now it's just a matter of being patient. I can go off and work on something else for a little while. Well, I used the Llewellyn drive to speed things up, so we're now cutting at about 23 feet per minute, which, using carbon steel bits in the old days, might have been a normal speed today with high-speed steel and carbide bits, that's very, very slow. Looking at the finish that I'm getting here, I had to take the bit out and sharpen it. It was not as sharp as I thought it was, and then I started over again. So first inch and a half I have an extremely smooth cut and then the depth of cut is a little bit deeper now in this rougher part so I'm not getting as smooth a finish as I had hoped but I'm really not surprised I'm pushing the tool just a little bit deeper than what I had hoped to normally use it at but it's going to be adequate for what I was saying that I was planning to do and that is to get a smooth surface on one side turn it over 
finish the other side and then turn it back and do a finish cut here. So I think in the long run I'm going to be okay. It's just going to take an uh, extra pass. And uh, at the moment it's just a little bit rougher than what I had hoped. So anyhow, let's let her cut for a while. It's taken quite a while, but we are getting nearer the end. Maybe an inch to go. Very close to the end. On the last pass, we were still curling a chip, and we're still doing that right now. But I think that we're going to have just a, a small number of passes before we stop making a good cut, and we can call this surface complete. We'll let this go one or two more times. See that this chip is not a, going to full length. That pass took very little. And so the tool is basically moving off the work. It will leave a burr at this edge. It will have to be taken off with a file or a hand scraper or something similar to that. Just a few little hair, little hairs cut on that pass. One or two more. And I'm going to bring this to a stop. So there it was. We just finished completing my very first cut with this machine. And we'll bring you in close in a moment to take a look at it, see how it turned out. What didn't happen, or what didn't I show? At one point, I had a belt come off. I had to replace that. Uh, early on, I resharpened the tool bit because I wasn't happy with the way it was cutting. At another point, I heard a little bit of squeaking up above, so I went up and lubricated those bearings. It's interesting, this one has Zerg fittings for grease, that one does not, it has a little oil cup in the top. So, a little bit of difference between those two. Let me bring you in close to take a look at the finish. So running my finger across here, 
I'm not completely happy with what I have. Initially, this is smooth. This is as if I took a surface grinder to it. Very, very smooth. But what happened here is I did the initial cut and then I resharpened the bit and then I started over again. So this is a shallow cut. This is a little bit deeper going through here. And that's the reason that I didn't get as smooth a cut on this. These bits, I find four to six thousandths of an inch is, gives about the best finish on this junk steel. If I go a little bit deeper than that, I start getting striations and that's what I feel along here. Still, overall, this is a very smooth finish along here. And now I just have to make a decision. Do I want to flip this over, cut the other side, or do I want to take another pass across here with this, just moving it down about four thousandths of an inch. And that's something that I'm going to think about for a while and then go ahead and uh, decide which one I'm going to pick, make the decision, do the other cuts. But in any case, I will be doing one more cut on this side and then I'll be flipping it over, doing cuts on the other side as well. At the moment, I am thinking that I'm going to probably take a second pass on this side. But for now, I think that's going to be it. That should be the end of the video. I've shown most of the functions of the planer and at this point in time I think we just all get bored just watching this go back and forth. Have a good day. Thank you. I decided to take another finishing cut on this side. It's amazing what you can see when you get some better light but I took a look at the surface closely and I noticed right here there were two hardened pins that had been inserted into holes drilled in this plate. There's also a third one over here. But these were right at the edge of where I went from that very smooth, almost surface ground type finish over into the striated finish. And what had happened is these hardened pins had actually damaged the cutting edge of the tool bit. So I've resharpened the tool bit, I've driven the pins in so they're below the surface, I'm not taking a finishing cut, it's a depth of five thousandths of an inch. The other thing that I did that offline was the belt had come off one more time when I tried this, and I looked up at the pulleys on the jack shaft, and I noticed that this one belt was running slightly over the edge. So I actually moved those pulleys in about an inch so that now the return belt is no longer running on the edge of the pulley has a good half inch of clearance on the uh, side, so I think it'll be less likely to jump off than it was before. So, I'm going to just let this go, and we're going to see how Mecha Godzilla in here manages to finish off this surface. Now we're finished. The finish is silky smooth. I like it.